afternoon, or good evening to those of you in Europe, and my apologies to those of you in Australia. Welcome to Session 7 of the ESIG 2020 Fall Technical Workshop, being held online on Tuesdays and Thursdays during the month of October and into early November. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of ESIG, and I'll provide a few brief opening remarks. As with so many things we were planning to do in person this year, our plans were derailed by the coronavirus, and here we are online again. The workshop was planned with the input of our ESIG Offerings Committee, chaired by Bethany Fru of Enrel and Julia Matoivasan of ERCOT. The committee consists of the chairs of our six working groups and several of our board members. We have a great set of volunteers who make ESIG what it is, and we encourage you to become involved if you're not already. Regarding logistics, I would <clears throat> ask you to note that the webinar will be an hour long. We'll have three individual presentations of approximately 12 to 15 minutes each, and we plan to hold the questions for a 15-minute Q&A session after the last speaker. As we're doing with all of our webinars now, we'll be using the Slido platform for managing the Q&A. We would ask you to use Slido for your questions, as you will not be able to ask the questions through WebEx. You should go to slido.com on your device and enter ESIG20 as the event code to ask your questions. Please be sure to indicate the person to whom you're addressing the question. The instructions are also in the background slide for the webinar, and you'll be reminded by the session chair. You'll see a thumbs up button next to the question on Slido to allow you to vote on prioritizing the questions submitted. So please keep the questions coming during the presentations and we will address them at the end. Recognizing the limitations of a webinar with typically more than 100 people on the line, the lines will be muted. So again, we ask you to use the Slido platform to ask your questions with eSig20 as the event code. Session seven today deals with a very timely topic, interregional transmission. We often forget that transmission is the glue that holds the system together and is a critical link in the decarbonization of the energy system. We'll be reminded in the session today. The session will be chaired by Wayne Golly of NextEra Energy Transmission, with Aaron Bloom of NextEra Analytics serving as co-chair. Wayne serves as the Executive Director of Development for the NextEra Transmission Group and has a long history in system planning, operations, market design, and transmission project development. Aaron is another well-known figure in the industry, most recently with NREL, where he led some outstanding renewable integration work. Aaron also chairs our ESIG System Planning Working Group. Both Wayne and Aaron are previous and familiar participants in ESIG e workshops, and we look forward to their continued participation. Wayne and Aaron, we appreciate having you here, and I'll now turn it over to you, Wayne. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, as Charlie said, either you know, good afternoon, good evening, or apologies to those uh, down under. Um, before we get going here, I did want to make a, a brief announcement, uh, something Aaron and I have been working on uh, with a, a team of, uh, I think, uh, some pretty inspiring people. Um, we are hosting, or ESIG is hosting, rather, um, a special group uh, call that we're naming the National Transmission Towards 100% Energy Group. And so this is going to be a, a focused effort uh, with a goal to uh, produce some educational, inspirational materials for policymakers uh, and inspire some public support around um, taking national action on transmission uh, with a vision of 100% uh, uh, carbon-free uh, grid. So. Uh, if you're interested in that, it is an invite-only um, group. Um, so uh, send a note uh, to ESIG or get in contact with Aaron or myself, and we'll be happy to get you on, on the list of invites. But there'll be five sessions, uh, November 11th, 13th, 16th, the 20th, and December 11th uh, to conclude uh, and, and finish off, uh, like I said, the goal of the white paper there. So with that advertisement out of the way, um, it's been nine years, uh, roughly, a little bit more, since uh, FERC Order 1000 was put into, to, um, uh, put into place. And I was thinking today uh, on my way into work, 
uh, you know, the, the title of this is Are We There Yet? Um, and I was trying to think of my best dad joke, but I wouldn't hear any of you laugh since you're all muted. So uh, I, I forewent the dad joke on Are We There Yet? Uh, but I do remember um, I found a quote from uh, Commissioner John Norse uh, after it was signed. He said, Order number 1000 sought to provide consumers and our economy with more efficiently priced and delivered electricity by introducing greater competition in the provision of transmission services. Um, so that's a quote from John Norris uh, shortly after the order was signed. Um, and we all know Order 1000 focused on three areas, basically reform, planning process reform, uh, cost allocation reform, and non-incumbent developer reform. So we're going to be focused on one of those prime objectives of that order um, in nine, a little bit over nine and a half years, uh, uh, looking back to see uh, whether we're there yet or not. Um, so with that, we've got three great speakers, uh, Jason McDowell, John Moore, and Bob Zavadil. Uh, they will present in that order. Um, and then, uh, as, as Charlie mentioned, uh, be using the slido.com uh, to be sending your questions uh, throughout the presentation. And then uh, Aaron will be running the Q&A uh, session after. So, First up is Jason McDowell. Uh, Jason is the Senior Technology Director of Strategy and Policy at the GE Consulting, at GE Consulting in Schenectady, New York. He has 20 years of industry experience in power system planning, operation, and engineering analysis, grid integration of multiple technologies, grid stability, and economic modeling, as well as development of regulatory policy, grid codes, and technical standards. So with that, I will turn the presentation over to Jason, and I look forward to hearing from him. Great. Well, thank you, Wayne, and uh, good day, everyone. First of all, I want to say thanks to, to you, uh, the chairs, uh, and to ESIG uh, for inviting me uh, to participate here with you today. It's certainly a pleasure, as always, uh, uh, to be speaking in, in, uh, in a great uh, forum like this. So um, I'd like to kick things off by talking about uh, interregional transmission and some critical success factors uh, that, uh, you know, we can really talk about that enable uh, interregional transmission as as a tool to move things forward uh, as as our grid evolves. Oops, I think there we go. And so I'd like to start things off by you know having uh, starting a dialogue and and asking the question: How do we think differently about how to unlock the benefits? that the interregional transmission planning can bring in terms of planning process, but also interregional transmission projects can bring as well. And I plan to ask a lot more questions in, in this session than, uh, than providing answers just to get the proverbial creative juices flowing. But um, I think the first thing to do is to set the stage on what do we mean by interregional transmission. And there are a, a host of different things that we can think about and, and that we mean and we'll touch upon in this session. The first of which, interregional meaning RTO to RTO or, or ISO to ISO, you know, area to area. And there are some challenges there. There are certainly benefits to spreading out the diversity and, and allowing a, a bigger footprint to deal with variability and uncertainty and sharing flexibility needs and, and resource capabilities across different RTOs and ISOs. But we also mean interconnection to interconnection at a very, at a, at a larger uh, stage, you know, to talk about how different regions in the U.S. and also different regions around, you know, an operating area or a country can work together. So with that, you know, we, um, we GE uh, 15, 20 years ago started around uh, looking at integration analysis for uh, looking at the impact of a renewable, variable renewable energy, um, and also uh, as the system needs evolved, uh, what what were some of the biggest reliability and, and uh, operation considerations way back when. The Western Wind Integration Study showed that there's great value of interregional cooperation uh, going beyond just one footprint. And one example of that is 
uh, what's obviously happening in California. We all know the duck and the duck today we know and in the future will continue to get fatter. The ramps in, in the evening will continue to be uh, more difficult to deal with uh, in California. And it's not only the ramps in the evening now, it's the ramps in the morning that, that are, are becoming more, more critical and uh, more challenging. So, you know, the questions as the duck gets fatter and as the net load approaches and maybe eventually even passes zero, how do we share those balancing needs? And, and how, how can we make sure the reliability of, of the footprint is maintained? Um, you know, that's where, you know, you, you talk about uh, interregional cooperation and interregional planning being a spread out the diversity, use what you have over a larger footprint to help balance and to help ramp uh, and meet the needs. Uh, and, you know, the question is, well, couldn't you do that with adding storage, too? And the answer is yes, you could. But really, what is the value of making the best of what you have and enabling all the capability over a larger footprint before you build anything new and invest in anything new in terms of, of cooperation and, and capability to uh, to balance and, and to keep the reliability and stability where it needs to be. So transmission, interregional transmission projects play an increasingly important role. Question is who pays for it, obviously. And that's where I guess the first round of questions I'd like to pose really, really starts to dig in. Um, the example I have on the right side of this slide is, you know, after we showed back uh, in the Western integration studies that there is value to spreading out, you know, the, uh, the diversity and the, and the footprint of sharing across larger, larger regions. Um, the, the energy imbalance markets have been put in place since around that same time, around 2014. And from then to now, there has been a lot of success in those imbalance markets uh, being very cost effective. In fact, uh, you know, from the, the Western EIM website, there's been about a million dollars of benefit that comes from, you know, uh, uh, shared dispatch costs, uh, looking at transfer costs, including flex ramp over larger footprint, uh, you know, also looking at greenhouse gas uh, implications to the cost and revenue as well. But sharing across a larger footprint allows a greater promotion of what is already out there and being able to manage variability and uncertainty and ramping and, and the capability to meet the needs in one area and spread that over a larger area. Um, see those things require a n new set of mechanisms and thinking about new incentives that can share flexibility and supply and load diversity over a larger area. Visibility and control is obviously a much bigger thing as well, that, that if you can be visible to your neighbors and, ha and also have your neighbors be visible to you in terms of what you need for reliability, that's, that's a key aspect. So is there a change in mindset needed to go beyond cost recovery models Focus on the value of, of the services that this interregional transmission can bring, um, you know, wind in other areas, uh, you know, flexibility coming from other areas and porting that flexibility to where it's needed most. And different business models also, different structures that incentivize more private investment and even direct participation of transmission to provide services in markets today. So those are all questions that I think we need to be be asking ourselves about, uh, you know, the value of interregional transmission. The other thing is to evaluate the benefit of interregional transmission um, and how, how to analyze this from a modeling and a data perspective and study perspective. So, you know, the, the next piece here that I'd like to simply touch on is an example with primary frequency response. So we all know that primary response depends on a bunch of things, including the type of unit uh, that's providing that response, how much headroom it has, how much it contributes, uh, how its governors are tuned, and also how its neighbors are behaving, you know, inside the footprint and outside the footprint. And unit commitment and dispatch really will determine the primary frequency response. But as more wind and solar come online and as things are ramping around, uh, how much total response is available and how much headroom is left. That becomes a much more complex question and certainly an important question to determine overall what are the pinch points in the, in the system? How do we provide frequency response under all operating conditions, especially the most challenging? 
So the plot that I have on the right is actually out of one of our studies we did some time ago in, uh, in ISO in the West that shows the different performa of uh, frequency response out of each unit, each online unit uh, at the time. And you can see uh, we're comparing the maximum governor response uh, where each unit peaks relative to the, the time it takes for it to get to its peak response. And there's a wide variety of, uh, of peak responses out of each unit. But what happens if you decommit some of those units that uh, have their peak response right when you need them and are most effective at mitigating a frequency excursion because you lost a lot of generation. Um, and, you know, that's, that becomes the big question about if you lose the best resources you have for frequency and support the grid, where do you get it from? So interregional transmission and, and planning around diversifying and bringing in, you know, more capability and knowing what else is out there in other footprints is very key. The other thing uh, that's very key is the notion that operations and stability matter more and more, where operations will determine the overall stability capability of the grid. When we have, you know, units that might be decommitted that we were counting on at one point, or we have, you know, units that are operating differently and may have less headroom. Uh, than we thought we would have, and therefore will not contribute as much. So that's another aspect that I think we need to be very cognizant of, and having an, an, um, an interplay uh, between the operations uh, uh, capabilities and, and how units are being dispatched, but what is the production cost, and how we're doing load flow stability is, is paramount. We call that the round trip, and that is becoming more and more critical to evaluating capabilities. The other thing is, um, you know, other new controls like HVDC controls uh, and, and other controls that allow uh, better sharing across the interconnections. How can those be utilized to, to share some of these, these capabilities um, and not just the provision of, of uh, power for the sake of adequacy, but the provision of the power for the sake of, uh, of keeping the stability needs where they need to be. So the next slide. Yeah, this last slide that, that I have is really talking about uh, stability in a different way. So we have plotted uh, here all of the wind and solar projects that have been interconnected or are planned to be interconnected uh, in the U.S. through 2020. And I wanted to point out that there are pockets, there are large pockets that occur around the seams. And those pockets are are really... Um, you know, focus on making sure that you have uh, stable controls and uh, as those pockets grow, the weak grid uh, connection becomes more challenging. The, the, to keep the, state, the control stable become more challenging. So um, knowing what your neighbors are doing is critically important because you can see in some of the, the circles that I have here, there's a lot of pockets between the MISO SBP interconnection. There's a lot of, of pockets there in the, in the southeast uh, and around New York, New Jersey, and, and New England. Those all uh, are critical, but when you look at that all together, it's going to be very critical to make sure you know what your neighbors are doing. And interregional transmission planning is about understanding how to assess the weak grid situations and control stability of what's happening just across the border. Regional AC transmission can help strengthen grids and improve short circuits. So what new visibility do we need to have and how do we look at sharing uh, this capability across regions is critically important. So with that, to wrap up, a whole bunch of, of conclusions here about what I just said, uh, new metrics, really should be considered how do we think differently about how transmission plays a role, how do we think differently about how we analyze this, including access to different interconnection data that is spread around, um, you know, different footprints and how to make that work together. I think that's another key aspect, how to pay for the transmission, um, and really understanding, too, the, the role of markets and, and what markets can play not only energy and balance, but capacity, ancillary services, and also paying attention to the increased granularity uh, of, of the markets themselves that can promote flexibility from area to area. So with that, um, I'll, I'll wrap it up there. 
and uh, we will glad to take any questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Uh, next up, we have John Moore. John is an attorney and director of the Sustainable FERC Project, the coalition-based initiative housed within Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, NRDC. Mr. Moore has nearly 20 years of experience advocating for transition to a clean, low-carbon, sustainable energy economy through reforms to FERC jurisdictional market operations and planning. With that, uh, John, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Wayne. I really appreciate uh, being part of this really wonderful presentation. As Wayne said, I direct the Sustainable FERC Project at NRDC. It's a coalition-based uh, group of organizations, uh, state, national, local, clean energy and environmental organizations that have been advocating at FERC and the RTOs for 25 years now. We got started in about 1996 when we saw a few of us at the time, I was not there, saw that there was an increasing need to advocate at FERC on behalf of uh, clean energy resources, and a lot of our early advocacy focused on the transmission system and expanding on the transmission system. In fact, when I first uh, started working on these issues in the early 2000s, we were, and I was in Chicago, we were really focused on the value of regional transmission organizations to help uh, connect customers with remote wind resources at the time and to reduce the number of individual transmission charges that accrued as they move through the different balancing areas. So transmission, uh, smartly designed transmission has been a priority for the FERC project now for 25 years. Moving forward a little more to Wayne's initial comments about FERC Order 1000, which is what I'm going to mostly discuss now. I went back and looked at Order 1000, the final Order 1000, uh, a couple days ago, and I was struck in reading the FERC's discussion on interregional uh, transmission coordination, how many of the commenters' concerns about the weakness in interregional planning in Order 1000 have actually come to pass. A number of commenters across the industry and environmental groups and others expressed significant concern in 2011 that FERC Order 1000's provisions around interregional planning and cost allocation didn't go far enough and would not produce meaningful results and that needs would go unmet. And I believe that has largely come to pass and is in fact the case. And that because of that, it's now time for FERC, it's well past time I would say, for FERC to re-examine a, a lot of aspects of Order 1000, but especially the interregional aspects and take firmer action. Because it's clear that the relatively limited requirement to engage in coordination of regional planning processes uh, interregionally is not sufficient. I'll also say that when back in 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 uh, 2011 and 2012 and 2013, the FERC project submitted over 24, 25 sets of comments to FERC on the individual RTO compliance filings. So. At the beginning, we saw Order 1000 as creating a lot of promise. I think that if I was to be completely honest, that a lot of what Order 1000 has become is largely a paper exercise. And that's unfortunate. And again, it's time, past time for FERC to act. I think it's really important, and I think, uh, I think some of Jason's comments actually touched on this, to recognize that interregional planning is only part of the overall planning and cost allocation puzzle. There's local planning, it's mostly utility managed and run. There's regional planning, there's generator, generator interconnection planning, there's the interregional planning that we're talking about here today on the panel, and then there's interconnection and actually cross interconnection planning, uh, which mostly doesn't happen. So interregional planning fits into this as part of the puzzle 
And if those other pieces, if if all the other pieces are being done well, then interregional planning can also be done better too. I think we, a number of us have significant concerns with the way some of these other pieces of the planning puzzle are being executed as well. And because of that, it's no surprise that interregional planning is not following, uh, is, is not producing more results. And here's why I think it ought to be producing results. I'm just taking an example in the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, uh, which has an enormous number of wind and solar and hybrid and even battery storage projects in the current interconnection queue. There's upwards of 90,000 megawatts plus of these projects in the queue right now. And associated with those, associated with those projects in the queue are a, an, is an enormous amount of network upgrades to in, integrate those new projects into the MISO system. MISO, of course, does an ongoing assessment of how much in network upgrades are necessary to integrate these proposed interconnections into the system. And the number is now into the billions of dollars. Uh, most of which they've expected the generators to pay for. And these numbers, these costs are far higher than generators can afford uh, and are willing to pay for. So as a result, very few, you know, south of 15%, in fact, it could be as low as five to 10% of these projects are getting interconnected. No one is suggesting that even a majority of projects might actually get interconnected, but when you consider the high, the enormous uh, megawatt, total megawatt size of the projects in the queue falling from or dropping from 30 or 40 percent down to under 10 percent is a pretty significant uh, number of projects that aren't getting approved. One of the dysfunctions we believe is that local projects dominate the queue, uh, the transmission upgrade process. Uh, this has been especially true over the last several years, and one of the re there are a number of reasons for it, uh, and we're not going to go into that now. But you can see in the draft 2020 MISO transmission expansion plan a list of approved projects. You know, 100% of those projects are local, uh, baseline re local reliability and other mostly local projects. There are uh, half a billion dollars worth of inter interconnection projects, but there are no econo purely economic regional projects. There are no purely economic uh, portfolio projects that would meet multiple reliability and other needs. Again, there are many reasons for that. Uh, but if all of the projects that are being built are local projects, there's something wrong with the regional planning system and the interregional planning process that says that uh, it indicates that, you know, if they're not being built. And really, one of the consequences is that a lot of generator interconnection projects are withdrawn. And I mentioned that before. Just right here, uh, we know that just in the last four years, over 30 gigawatts of projects have been withdrawn. Again, we have a lot of projects in the system right now that are active in MISO, uh, but many projects have withdrawn, been withdrawn. And the same is true in Southwest Power Pool, not at the same high levels, but nevertheless, the same kind of situation. Um, I want to just tease out SPP and MISO for one more minute, which is that I think for the fourth time in a row, if not the fourth year, but for the fourth time in a row, a joint MISO SPP system study found no valid interconnection projects needed to be built across the system. That's striking to us, and I think to many other people, given the billions of dollars in these generator interconnection network upgrade driven projects that I just talked about a minute ago. So something is wrong with an interconnection study where you've got billions of dollars of needed upgrades to the system on either side of the, on, in either RTO, and yet the interconnection, the interregional planning process is not producing any, any results. There are a number of reasons for this. Some of them touch on, I think, 
the work uh, and the information Jason just presented. The different the two different RTOs use different uh, models. They use different futures. The futures are not aggressive enough, and they use a lot of different assumptions uh, in the study process. With the result being that the benefits look different on different in the different RTOs, and you just don't get to a place of agreement on what actual project should look like. So that's a big concern for us, uh, and I think one of the practical implications of not having uh, one a single model, uh, a single model to study those projects, is that you get a, you you get different measurements of benefits, and since the cost allocation or the allocation of costs for those projects depends largely on the benefits, if you're getting different information on the benefits in the different RTOs, you're going to get uh, you know. Uh, erroneous allocate, uh, cost allocation. So I think the MISO SPP process and the fact that there have been virtually no significant interregional projects approved in the entire United States since 2011, very few, not significant, shows that Order 1000 is not working. It required only this coordination of planning, but not an actual plan. It has required what has been referred to as a triple hurdle approval process, requiring the approval of each of the RTOs plus the joint uh, group studying the interregion, the interregional planning itself. There's not a minimum standard for the different types of benefit metrics, let alone, as I said, a uniform set of benefit metrics to be applied to those projects. I mentioned competition for most non-reliability projects. That's driven most development in both you know, regional and interregional planning away. I'm not going to, we don't really want to talk too much about that. We don't have time to talk about the effects of competition, but it has been a, a depressing factor. Uh, and the result is mostly local projects, fewer regional projects, and no interregional projects. What can FERC do? That's obviously, uh, and I've just mentioned this again, I'm, uh, the MISO SPP studies have yielded no projects, which I think is Exhibit A in the case for FERC to do something about this. You know, what would success look for us uh, like look like for us at FERC uh, and at the RTOs? Well, first, very generally around the planning process, one is that RTOs would look at planning more holistic and look at both local and regional needs together instead of in the bottom-up process for local and the top-down process for regional. MISO is planning to approve, I think, upwards of 500 projects at over $4 billion in this current planning cycle, and none of those projects, as I said earlier, are regional projects. They're all local projects, some of which are very necessary, but we're quite confident that some of those uh, address needs that could be more cost effectively may be met by regional projects at a minimum. There also needs to be coordinated planning of the gener inter inter generator interconnection upgrade projects and the network upgrade projects uh, together with long range planning. That's not happening either. And then finally, what I'll talk about just in the next couple of minutes, the need for new FERC standards for an oversight of interregional planning. What do we want in interregional planning? This is what we're going to be taking to FERC this year. We believe we need a single set of metrics and planning criteria for interregional studies. And we believe we need to eliminate the triple hurdle approval process. Those are the two fundamental requirements and reforms that we've been discussing for at least the last several years. That's the minimum, we believe. We think it would also behoove FERC if it looked a little more assertively into the issue and set up new interregional planning boards to both select projects and allocate the costs of those projects. And we believe that FERC can use the same authority under uh, Section 206 of the Federal Power Act to, that it used to develop uh, regional transmission organizations to help uh, to, to set up these interregional planning boards. It probably will not be the easiest lift uh, to achieve, but we think that's also really important. We also think that FERC should create a new Office of Transmission Planning. This would allow FERC staff 
to oversee planning and investment a little more carefully, and it would be directly analogous to FERC's uh, existing and long-established Office of Energy Markets regulation. There is no there is no equivalent office for planning. FERC's got one for reliability. It's got one for markets. It's got one for uh, policy in general, but nothing for this. It would increase doing so would increase data transparency and access to that data. It would allow consideration of a range of alternatives. And most important, we believe, for the purpose of this discussion, it would facilitate the development of more interregional and connection-wide um, interconnections among different regions, which we think is quite critical. I think in addition to these solutions, we would like to see more direct engagement with NREL and other DOE labs in the FERC planning and oversight process here. And, you know, just echoing Jason, we've started looking into the idea of participant funding as well to help move these projects along. So, Wayne, with that, I think I'm done, and I look forward to the additional discussion on the topic. Great. Thanks so much, John. Appreciate those uh, perspectives. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we have Bob Zavadil. Uh, so, Bob is the Chief Operating Officer and co-founder of Internex, now part of the Chesi Companies. Uh, he has over 40 years of experience in the electric utilities industry, beginning as an electric distribution line crew intern on the Great Plains and a special studies engineer with Nebraska Public Power District. Um, he's been interesting. I've known Bob for a while. I never knew he was a lineman intern. So. <laughs> uh, uh, he has been involved with renewable generation for over three decades and includes among his clients over this time transmission utilities, renewable project developers, wind turbine and solar PV inverter OEMs, and research organizations such as EPRI, DOE, and the National Labs. So with that, Bob, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, thank you, Wayne. I'm kind of a mic check. I had to revert to my old hardware. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, afternoon, folks. It's good to be here. It'd be better to be in uh, Tucson or San Antonio or something like that. Hopefully, uh, 2021 will find us there. Um, I'm going to pick up on a, a few threads that were left um, hanging by both Jason and John in the previous presentations, talking about interregional transmission planning for renewables. Um and so when I first saw the presentation title, which is sort of given to me, <clears throat> my first question was next round. Did we actually have a first round? And uh, this echoes some of what John says. Well, we, we did, as a matter of fact, uh, coming from FERC Order 1000, which allowed us to uh, essentially plan, <clears throat> plan and build transmission that wasn't uh, for the um, traditional purpose of reliability only. Uh, economics and achievement of uh, renewable energy goals were, um, <clears throat> were were valid propositions for for building transmission, assuming that cost benefits <clears throat> could be shown to be favorable. Um, this is because that uh, kind of like forever the uh, best renewable resource areas didn't really align with where the load was at. And you can slice and dice that with with wind and solar in any part of the country, and it kind of comes out not to be true, although with offshore, we're maybe um, seeing a new twist on that. Um, here, one second. So <clears throat> we've been spending a lot on transmission, as, as John intimated, um, over the last 10 years. Um, and where has that gotten us? Well, <clears throat> we've got over 100 gigawatts of, of wind in the ground and operating. Uh, 70 gigawatts, all types of solar, but a uh, substantial fraction of that is bulk connected. Um, so it seems like we're doing pretty good, but we have to realize that that combination still accounts for less than 10% of um, U.S. electric energy demand. Um, renewables continue to be a major, major driver for uh, transmission planning at the regional level in the RTOs, and um, the the current fleet, I mean, what we're dealing with already is, is causing some of the RTOs to at least start taking a peek outside of their footprint and, and consider that interregional solutions may need to be studied, but we're, we're a ways away from that, it appears. Um, some of this may be due to the uh, fact of the status quo, which are these two-year expansion planning cycles where you maybe look out 10 years and you advance it 
and um, and go along that way. So um, the bigger amounts where we need to be aren't really on the radar yet. So I dug out <clears throat> some old slides just to give some numbers to that context. Uh, Ten years ago or so, Jason mentioned the Western Wind and Solar Integration Study, and my company was involved with the Eastern Wind Integration and Transmission Study. And um, maybe the folks in the utility industry would say those weren't fair because we could just assume that magically there were going to be all these wind turbines everywhere or wind and solar in the case of the Western study. And we would uh, kind of work backwards to sort of understand what transmission would be needed uh, to accommodate that in the very simplest sense of moving the energy to load. But the number that <clears throat> kind of struck me as I was thinking about this presentation was that in the Eastern study, which involved the Eastern interconnection, the target was 20% of the Eastern <clears throat> interconnection um, demand, 2008-2009, uh, um, be met by wind. And um, looking at the wind resources from the NREL database and trying to concoct some scenarios, uh, that was 230 gigawatts for the eastern interconnection only. So that's twice the installed fleet just in the eastern interconnection. And obviously, significant transmission was required to move that around because there were some RTO footprints uh, that were absolutely swamped with, uh, swamped with wind and, um, you know, always had um, more wind than load kind of thing. So <clears throat> in looking at the transmission concepts, not plans, because of the volumes of energy and the distances involved, um, HVDC was the um, <clears throat> really the only viable uh, alternative technology-wise at that point. And um, what's seen here is one of the uh, black crayon overlay, overlays developed for one of the scenarios and sort of the, the ballpark cost estimate was $100 billion for this overlay, which certainly is a lot of money. But um, if we're, you know, spending $25, $30 billion a year uh, meandering along, um, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's not so much. Now, obviously, this wasn't an incremental view, but the real question that jumps out is how would we ever get to something like this with our current process, and would that even be – possible. So going forward, obviously, this interregional development, simply because of what's in the ground already, um, is, is necessary. Um, the economics of bulk wind and solar are driving that. I mean, it's, it's, not, a, uh, it's not, a, not a policy or a subsidy matter anymore. It's really just the cost of the energy, and it's, it's uh, top of the list due to that. The transmission plant space is becoming more complicated, though, with the substantial growth of DER, um, the fact that we will see offshore wind generation off the East Coast, and then the emergence of bulk energy storage, which is potentially an, op an option to offset some transmission needs. Um, but, but nonetheless, um, you know, transmission is one of the tools in the toolbox uh, to facilitate these larger volumes of, um, of energy. So the, the, the current expansion planning has to consider the growing renewable fleets or projected growth, um, but are they challenged too much by sort of the bottom-up, two-year cycle, inside-out viewpoint that you take of the world or really need to take of the world with regard to the, uh, the overall construct and the, the stakeholder participation? But it seems in the last three years or so, one of the – one of the things in the news that's really um, resonated with me are the commitments to 100% clean energy and decarbonization amongst um, various U.S. states, uh, some of them very populated. Um, we're seeing this gain a lot of traction, and the implications for future renewable targets are pretty substantial. And then if we're talking about 100% uh, in 50% of the population, uh, that's a lot more renewables than we have now. Couple that with the fact that if we talk about decarbonization, expect, especially extending into transportation, uh, the amount of renewables for 100% or whatever your high target is uh, goes up proportionately. So <clears throat> maybe that inflection point will be one of the reasons we need to revisit what we do because a lot of these targets are still out 25 
well, I should say 15, 20, 25, 30 years, um, but you can't build transmission overnight. We have the knowledge and most of the tools needed to do this in a reasonable basis. I mean, we're, we're finding now that some of the longstanding tools we've done are maybe a little bit deficient with regard to the inverter-based resources and those kinds of things, but that's engineering work and it likely will be resolved. Um, we probably need to sharpen our pencils a little bit with regard to how we plan with new transmission technologies, namely lots of HVDC, both conventional and even um, voltage source, um, you know, HVDC light now could, you know, put a wrinkle in some of the studies or add to the studies that we need to do. But again, those are just engineering questions. Um, the, the real issue in my mind is sort of our normal or conventional versus these extended planning horizons. Um, obviously, developing the future is not a uh, not an easy deal. Um, you know, I thinking about interregional planning, each RTO has its group of stakeholders and then you need another group of stakeholders when you're doing a regional planning. And so the development of the, you know, the futures, the target we're shooting at <clears throat> can be a um, almost an intractable problem in and of itself. So that's maybe where the <clears throat> state commitments, the state by state commitments start to provide some clarity in defining that, that future state that we actually need to, uh, we need to look at. Um, so to do this, this is this is above my pay grade. John probably has a better, a much better understanding of this. So if we went from regional to interregional or even interconnection wide, what what is that process? What does that infrastructure look like in terms of who participates, who directs the process, how are decisions reached, and actually who's who's driving? Um, all questions that I don't have any answers to. So just to summarize here quickly, it, it seems like we're at a point where we're maybe close to outgrowing our current infrastructure for transmission planning. Um, the, the quantities of renewables that we're already considering uh, require us to sort of step back and look at the larger picture rather than simply getting these facilities interconnected to the local grid and then <clears throat> worrying about what happens to the energy later. Um, big question in my mind is, you know, could the current process we have lead to a bulk system that can support that dramatically different future that's portended by the state goals that are, are uh, you know, being introduced almost every day now. So if, if the answer to that is no, what do we need instead or in addition? Again, this is um, in, in John's court. Uh, the one thing that I, in my discussions for this session and some other things going on, um, have heard come up several times as kind of an analogy is the uh, National Defense Highway Act, you know, that led to the interstate highways. And, you know, given that we're fully 60 years or more on from that, is that simply a relic from the past or are there some relevant lessons that we can learn now? Uh, different generation, different politics, you know, all those sorts of things, but you can't argue that um, we all use them and we all love them. So um, just, uh, just the thought I wanted to throw in there. So with that, I'll I'll stop and uh, throw it back to Wayne, and we'll try to move forward to uh, adjournment. Great, thanks, Bob. Appreciate those insights. Um, so with that, um, Aaron Bloom, my trusty co-chair, uh, will be uh, running the Q and A session. Uh, we have, um, by my watch, about 12 minutes left. So. Uh, Aaron will pick some of the questions and uh, throw them back at the panel. Yeah, so we got all sorts of great questions here, and um, we've got the, the first one comes from Brian Palmentier. So uh, this one is a question about the international perspectives from around the world. Uh, anything that we can learn? Are you guys aware of people that have figured it out in China or Europe? Jason, I know you spend so much time with people. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, and uh, thanks, Brian, for the question. Uh, there's a few examples that I can point to that I'm, you know, we've heard over probably the past uh, better part of a decade. Uh, one is the initiative of, of China around the global energy interconnection, and to tie 
you know, resources and Chinese technology of HVDC to to tie together Asia with uh, Middle East and and you know Eastern Europe, and and those projects uh, are very big, uh, very expensive, and they're funded in in a much different way than we're talking about right now. But uh, the global energy interconnection is is one of the the uh, initiatives. The other one that's probably a little bit more developed and maybe a little bit more relevant is the Asia Super Ring to connect Japan uh, through. To, through Korea, uh, to Russia, ultimately to Inner Mongolia, to share wind resources that are rich uh, around the northwestern part of China and in, Mon in Mongolia, all the way through into into Russia and ultimately to Japan, uh, and helping to helping Japan decarbonize and denuclearize as well. So I think those are the two main projects that I'm I'm aware of that have a lot of funding. The Asia Super Ring is funded uh, mostly by private investment through. SoftBank and, and other private investors in Japan, uh, and um, uh, you know, so that that may be a little bit better of a of a um, an example of what we're talking about here is an incentive. But um, those are the ones that I know about. But are, are those just pipe dreams as well? No, no. There's an MOU that's been signed, and part actually of the Asia Super Ring has been built. It's not connected yet. There's a long way to go, and as you can imagine, there's a lot of complexity there. But that's uh, the, that's an ongoing project. Uh, there is a lot of funding on these big projects coming out of China, and the Chinese uh, connections have been started. The question is how far they they are able to push uh, uh, farther west. Uh, so again, the projects have been started, but a long way to go before they're completed. Wow, awesome. Yeah, that, that's a great answer. Anybody else have something to add before we, we go to the next question? Oh, Bob, are you trying to? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Uh, just uh, getting up the curve on what my uh, colleagues in uh, in Italy have been up to. Um, they've done substantial work over the last 10 or 15 years on country interconnections. And, you know, those are simply based on economic prospects. The one thing I will say is that the um, the funding for that is always really clear. I mean, if the project shows great upside potential, there's some sort of international entity um, that is, um, you know, quick to quick to finance. So that's one where uh, you show it pays and someone will pay for it. So it's a little more streamlined than uh, – Interesting. What we're dealing with here. Great. Um, awesome, awesome comment. I want to get to a couple more here. So, Jason, uh, you got you got two questions in a row here. Um, one about the pros and cons about building across the same machine, and, and another one about building across the interconnection. Yeah, so I, I see them, and, and thanks, Barry, for the question. I see the other one, too, about, uh, you know, it, the, the building across uh, SPP MISO and um, you know, I think the answer is one and the same in that, you know, what I showed in that map is that when you have a lot of big pockets, especially close to the seams, you can, when you only look at the control stability and, and the capability of, of those pockets, uh, relative to their, their connection around weak grids, and making sure that you don't have a lot of control interaction. If you were, uh, first of all, to look at, Strengthening those areas by adding transmission from other areas, uh, that helps. It helps to spread out, you know, where the resource is best and strengthens the grid so, so you have a stronger connection and can accommodate more, more renewables in those areas. Obviously, it also promotes more sharing and balancing capability across the seams as well. Um, you know, also sharing of, and, and greater coupling of things like frequency response, reg, inertia, uh, you know, and from interconnection to interconnection, that's a big deal. From area to area, you know, Eastern Interconnect obviously is, is generally connected, but the more sharing you can promote over the transmission, obviously the easier it is to do the balancing. And visibility is another issue too. If you have one area that that has a lot of wind and the, the neighboring uh, system operator doesn't know it's there, the electrons don't care about the border. You're still going to have instabilities uh, if there's a, a weak connection there. So that's another big issue of, of understanding how much is just across the border and, and what is across the border, you know, what to watch out for. 
Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great comment. Um, one of the things that strikes me, it seems like the planning process is set up to say, eh, don't really interconnect here versus please come interconnect here. Like we see in economic development and other places, like is the paradigm broken? Is it, is it shifted in the wrong direction? What do you guys think? It's an interesting question. I, I think the paradigm is changing, obviously. The, the more resources you have in one area, and we all know that, you know, for a long time, it, it's, it's windy and we can, we can add in wind and we can add in solar generation where people don't necessarily live, and therefore there's not a lot of really strong grids historically. But as we build out, uh, there's certainly more potential to, to make the most use of the, out of that resource and, and project it where it's needed most, both in terms of uh, geographic diversity, temporal diversity for time, um, making sure we're linking the output of, of those projects and those capabilities with the load of, of what's needed. So I, I think those are the types of things that we need to start thinking about. Aaron, I don't think. Yeah, you know, let me just say, I don't think. I don't think it is working uh, right now. I think we're going in the wrong direction, and I think the data supports us with that. And to echo what I think Bob said, you know, we see the need for 60, 70 gigawatts of new uh, generation every year, and these local projects are not. The, the, the current planning process is not producing the kinds of uh, projects that are going to meet those needs. Period. Yeah, I think that was one of the questions I saw buried in here. You know, it's tough on Slido and you've got some ranking and just a lot of other ideas coming in, but, you know, 90 gigawatts in the MISO queue, I mean, that's not even enough to get us on the path towards the, the, the measly little numbers they looked at in EWICS compared to 100%. I mean, it seems like we're just looking at this all wrong. Yeah, right, when most of those gigawatts will probably fall out of the queue on top of it. So, so we've also discussion. got a bunch of questions here about offshore wind. Uh, the things that, that people were hoping would happen in New England and the Mid-Atlantic in 2008, and the reason they said they didn't need our big transmission lines might be happening, right? We're talking about gigawatts of offshore wind. Is that is that going to say we don't need these big mega transmission projects? No, I think it's going to change what you would build, um, but. It's it's not there's there's not one answer here I don't think it's quite clear there isn't just one answer there's going to be backbone transmission there's going to be participant funded uh, you know generator funded transmission and I think we will you know you can easily imagine if we're really talking 60 to 70 gigawatts a year how quickly will we start uh, wanting to move offshore to add more of those gigawatts especially along the population filled coasts. So, John, we've got a question. I think your slide deck touched on it, but I, I want to emphasize it here. You know, it seems like nobody wants to pay. Is there a good cost allocation solution out there? What do you think? Well, that's why I mentioned, and I think uh, Bob also asked the question about participant funding as an alternative, along with a requirement for uh, paying for more portfolio benefits. I think cost allocation has been come so siloed into into uh, reliability, economic, and public policy-driven uh, projects that nothing really adds up. And this has been a big problem in PJM, where the rules, parts of the rules looked really good around uh, you know, transmission being built to meet state public policy needs, but then putting all the cost on the states that benefited from them alone is just, again, not, not produce anything. I think the best thing that, hopefully one of the good things that will come out of the SPP MISO study will be more state engagement because both sets of states are involved in that and that has been the, mo the most intractable problem has been working on who benefits and who pays and i'm i'm kind of with bob i had the same i've had the same thought over the last couple of weeks thinking back to the national interstate highway system and the different way to fund projects because every time we do one of these major builds you're going to get states that are going to say no and you'll state get states that will even take the RTO to court to avoid paying for it. So something is, is clearly broken on, on, the, on who pays. Great, so um, I, I, I've got about one minute left here, so I'm gonna sneak in one more question before I let uh, Wayne, Wayne wrap us up here. It comes back to visibility. Um, people talk about needing to understand the visibility for, for uh, making sure that you can monitor what's happening next door and how it impacts your system, visibility about the planning process, what you're assuming in the queue. How do we solve this? Is it like one person said, Jess, do we need to try to merge the RTOs? I 
That's interesting. I think visibility has so many different layers, right? And I'll start and maybe, maybe John and, and Bob can, can chime in here. But uh, the first of, of which is visibility in uh, the planning analysis. And, um, you know, back to the, the MISO and SPP SEAMS evaluation, you know, there's um, uh, when you evaluate the pinch points in the system, what are the biggest issues? And I think we're, we're seeing in other areas, like in talk with ERCOT recently, it's not the, the peak load or the light load that really matters anymore. It's what happens in between. And those, those system operating conditions tend to drive the, the biggest issues. And if you can spread uh, the capabilities around a larger area, and if you can have visibility between areas, you can operate differently, having bigger headroom. You can have more capability to understand how to uh, pull in units that are capable of ramping and providing, uh, you know, uh, essential reliability services. So I think that's a big, big question about visibility and controls to make sure you're spreading out the capabilities across a, a wider footprint for the better use of, uh, of the grid. The, the comment I would make to follow that up is, that if we're really talking about decarbonization and those sorts of things and what grid we would need, we can't, in my opinion, build incrementally with AC to get there. I mean, we're, we're, we have to go to HVDC. We have to fly over the problem in a way that we're not, you know, every line we build creates operating constraints on the underlying grid. Um, so, you know, you have to take a really big bite to start, in my opinion, because if you're going to try to do it incrementally, you'll kind of meander around and never get there. And oh, Aaron, I love it. Uh, oh, go ahead, John. One last yeah, comment. Right. I would just close the way I opened with uh, the comment that all the problems that were predicted by some in 2011 have come home to roost for us and that incrementalism and fragmented planning is not the way to go. So we do ultimately need something looking like interconnection-wide planning. Well, I'd like to uh, thank uh, our guest panelists. Uh, it's a great session, I think. Um, timely, as Charlie mentioned in, in his openings. Um, nine and a half year look back, uh, and here we are. So, <laughs> um, but um, so again, I'd like to thank our panelists. Uh, thank all of you uh, online for your participation. Uh, I feel like this off session has offered some great insights into the status and prospects for transmission. Um, at least some inspiration and some stimulating thoughts to uh, to move forward. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody there are five more technical sessions um, going to be held during the remainder of the month and into early November. Uh, you can see the full schedule uh, on the eSIG website, and uh, you're all invited to attend. Uh, the next session is going to be on DER evolution and system impacts, and that will be this Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern. So thanks again for your participation. Uh, everybody stay safe out there, um, and we look forward to seeing you again then. All right. Bye now.